Hello, and welcome to the Duke Cardiology Conference. I'm Sunil Rao, Associate Professor of Medicine at Duke University Medical Center. Today's program is titled TABI, Current Concepts and Future Directions, and our distinguished guest is Dr. Kevin Harrison, Professor of Medicine at Duke University Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Sunil. So, you know, Kevin, there's a lot of excitement now about transcatheter aortic valves, forcing us to revisit a disease that I think a lot of us haven't thought about lately. Uh, you know, aortic stenosis. So tell us what's new and, and what we need to learn about TAVI. Well, I think there are some new things to learn about TAVI. Uh, it really gives us the opportunity to treat some people that were typically left out of uh, the classical treatment algorithms. A lot of elderly patients with comorbid uh, illnesses where they had severe aortic stenosis and heart failure but couldn't be treated. Mm -hmm. And uh, the mortality in that group is really high, as you know, so uh, this gives us an opportunity to treat some of those people who are classically left out of the health system uh, treatment arms. Uh, how it will play out for all patients with aortic stenosis, I think, is early mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to tell. But the, the results uh, worldwide have been encouraging. The results... Uh, so far in the United States, encouraging, mm -hmm. and that we're going to keep going forward with some of these trials. Great. So you have some data for us, right? So let's get started. Okay, good. So I, I wanted to just show you that uh, the valve pathology, which we, we don't typically get a good look at on the left side there, and then the, the uh, end of the talk, we'll talk about the core valve prosthesis and how it's uh, going on in the U.S. trials. Uh, this uh, pathology in adults that is degenerative aortic valve stenosis is really uh, impressive in terms of the heavily uh, calcified uh, stiff leaflets that uh, these patients have. So unlike uh, children with bicuspid aortic valve stenosis who have thin leaflets, even if they have significant stenosis, the pathology here really is limiting in terms of what you can do with it in the cath lab. And these uh, transcatheter uh, valve implantations, uh, basically stents with uh, implanted valves uh, sewn in them, really have taken us to a new level in terms of treating this pathology. In the right-hand panel, you see the typical features of aortic valve stenosis that we're all used to in the cath lab. We've all gotten very uh, astute at making accurate measurements of aortic valve gradients, such as the one you see shaded on the left. Uh, but uh, we oftentimes don't see the pathology them itself. Uh, the surgeon's uh, very familiar with this. Uh, this is the typical mode of diagnosis. Transthoracic echocardiography is uh, really how these patients are diagnosed. Uh, certainly physical examination is often not subtle. You have a loud outflow murmur, but really the confirmation of the disease is typically transthoracic echocardiography, and you can see the thickened valve leaflets here uh, at the uh, annular level and the relative immor immobility. Uh, echo is really great for following uh, the uh, severity of the valve stenosis, and so over time, you can do serial echoes to keep track of how bad uh, someone's aortic valve stenosis is becoming. Going back a little bit historically, uh, we became interested in this uh, 20 years ago when aortic valvuloplasty was done to attempt to treat some of these patients who were left out of the surgical algorithm. So uh, in adolescence, it's, it's still shown to be a, a um, useful procedure. Children with bicuspid valves can be palliated sometimes for years or even decades before they need valve surgery. Mm -hmm. But uh, in adults, uh, we the hope was 20 years ago that this really might palliate and even treat people for years or decades, and, and really that didn't pan out. So the, uh, the transcatheter valve implantation has moved forward now mm -hmm. two decades later to a technology that really allows us to better treat these people with uh, transcatheter uh, treatment. This is again data from Duke uh, 20 years ago looking at uh, patients that underwent uh, a first or a second balloon aortic valvuloplasty for symptomatic severe aortic stenosis. All these patients had high-risk features for surgery. In a minority of those patients, when they represented after a first valvuloplasty with symptoms, they were then considered to be improved enough to tolerate surgery. And uh, 
in a, about a third of those, they did go on for surgical valve replacement. And the reason I show this is to highlight the dramatic difference in treatment uh, if you do have your valve replaced between those patients who could not. And also to show this number, this uh, one-year mortality in the medically treated or balloon valvuloplasty arm of about 50%. And even though we're 20 years down the road, that number is going to come up again in the partner's trial. 50% one-year mortality treated medically is, uh, is still out there despite our best medical treatment. So, Kim, I mean, that's a remarkable statistic. I mean, it's worse than many cancers, actually. What was happening here from a physiological level? Like, why didn't balloon valvuloplasty work? Well, I think it goes back to the pathology. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, balloon valvuloplasty or balloon commissurotomy for mitral stenosis, it does work. Uh, but the pathology is different because you have fibrosis of the commissures, which can be split and really permanently improved with balloon uh, dilation. Um, balloon valvuloplasty for aortic valve stenosis really doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. It will dilate the annular structures uh, temporarily, but there's quick recoil of that. And some of the calcific deposits of the leaflets can be cracked and made more mobile, but the amount of improvement you can get with the balloon alone is really modest, mm -hmm. and the pathology continues to progress uh, over time. So in our hands, at uh, about a year, about 75% of people were back to their wow. baseline gradients uh, with balloon valvuloplasty alone. So that reminds us that not all valves are the same, even within the same patient. Exactly. Wow. Now, I think an interesting feature and certainly something that we are using for the uh, core valve trial is the STS online risk calculator. And I don't show this slide to show you the specific numbers, but just to highlight the fact that you can now go online to a free uh, website if you, uh, if you use a search engine to look up uh, STS online risk calculator. You can pull that up and you can enter in uh, some baseline patient demographics, which include age, uh, creatinine, lung disease, those kind of things, and it will immediately give you a mortality estimate in terms of surgical valve replacement, whether it's aortic surgery or bypass surgery or other valve surgeries. Uh, it is somewhat limited, and, and certainly uh, people can argue about the actual number that it's coming up with uh, based on the registry data that's in the computer, but Nevertheless, it gives you a starting ground for knowing what someone's risk really might be. And what are you considering high risk? Uh, what, what type of cutoff for, let's say, mortality would you say is someone's too high risk for surgery? So high risk uh, aortic valve replacement surgery in the U.S., uh, or at least in these trials, is considered to be an operative risk of about 15 percent or greater. Okay. I see. Uh, in the STS risk calculator, typically people uh, believe that the true risk uh, is about one and a half times the number that you get in the STS registry. Mm -hmm. But if you, as I'll show you in the, in the randomized partner data, that really didn't prove to be true. Hmm. But uh, as far as the trials ongoing right now, they're looking for patients where the estimated yeah. operative mortality at 30 days is 15% or greater. I see. And these are 30-day numbers. Yes, these are 30-day mortality numbers, really 30-day hospitalization, yeah. typically what the surgeons consider operative mortality risk. Mm -hmm. Interesting. This is a cartoon of the two types of valve uh, prosthesis that are um, being investigated in the United States. On the top is the core valve uh, system, and on the uh, bottom is the uh, sapien valve. Uh, they are fairly different in their uh, method of deployment and their actual structure, but they achieve the same goal. Uh, both of them start with balloon aortic valvuloplasty to try to improve the uh, valve uh, and allow this device, which is fairly high profile, to be passed uh, in a retrograde fashion across the aortic valve. The, uh, on the top panel, to start with that, is the core valve prosthesis, which is a self-expanding nitinol stent, which is positioned on the LV outflow tract side of the aortic valve, and then as the sheath is withdrawn, the nitinol hourglass, hourglass stent is deployed, leaving the valve in the middle. The Edwards sapien system is similar in that, again, you see it with the balloon valvuloplasty in position, mm 
uh, as the core valve, but it's a shorter valve prosthesis and it's balloon expandable. And so these features really add a different uh, technique mm -hmm. uh, for deploying these two valves. The photograph of the two, just to show you this uh, balloon expandable uh, Sapien valve, which has uh, pericardial valve tissue uh, sewn inside the, uh, the stent. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit thicker. You can see the valve uh, tissue is a bit thicker. And of course, with it being balloon expandable, it's a higher profile system in the current state in terms of delivery. Uh, this valve, though, also does allow you to place this valve from an LV apical approach. So that's another advantage of the valve on the left is for patients that have severe per peripheral disease where the catheter can't be placed mm -hmm. from an arterial side retrograde, this valve can be used from an apical approach in surgery. The core valve is a really totally different uh, design, sort of a double uh, hourglass that's asymmetric with an LV outflow uh, tract inflow of the uh, valve here and then a larger uh, open architecture circuit uh, for the stent uh, on the outflow side of the prosthesis. And this is a, a porcine uh, aortic valve. So the valve struts are a bit thinner and it allows, uh, because it's not balloon expandable and has slightly uh, lower profile, allows for a little easier delivery system from peripheral approach. So I assume they're obviously available in different sizes and there, and I think you're gonna to get to this, but there must be a fair amount of pre-procedure evaluation to make sure that uh, you've got the right uh, device. I mean, this is not like putting in a stent where you've got, you know, 53, five stents on the shelf, I assume. That's right. They're, they're, and I think uh, from the surgeons, they're used to this. They're used mm -hmm. to a lot of pre-procedural planning in terms of anatomy and trying to understand what they're going to do at the yeah. time of surgery. Uh, for us on the interventional side, I think from the coronary perspective, we've gotten very comfortable looking at anatomic details of the coronaries to make sure we have an approach that's going to work. Uh, on the structural side, especially with uh, transcatheter valve implantation, a lot of us are, are on a steep lear learning mm -hmm. curve to get some of these imaging techniques up yeah. so that we understand the anatomy. And really there's two things that have to be understood is, it, will the valve be functional and effective when it's put in place and can you safely get it there? Mm -hmm. And those two features from an anatomic point of view are really critical and require a lot of advanced imaging. Yeah, and it almost requires a change in mindset, doesn't it, for the interventional cardiologist? Yeah, I think it really does because you're not just making a diagnosis of aortic valve stenosis, but you're thinking about which uh, way should we go. Mm -hmm. Clinically, is the patient a standard surgery candidate, which is still a great option? And if they're not a standard surgery candidate, which one of these uh, types of prostheses might work based mm -hmm. on the anatomy? Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about this, but that's probably where the field ultimately is going to be headed as we start getting more and more of these valves once they get approved, commercially available. And that may be a decision that face cl faces clinicians over the next five to 10 years. Right, and I, and I think really there are certain cases that we've already seen where one prosthesis over another really has an advantage for certain anatomic yeah. characteristics of the mm -hmm. patient. So I don't see either one of these uh, uh, systems as mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted to turn now to the data that we've uh, been presented over the last uh, year uh, from uh, the excellent study done in the partner trial. Uh, and the DCRI really uh, deserves a lot of credit for the coordination of that trial and the data uh, collection and analysis. But to show you a little bit of the highlights of that uh, and the fact that it is similar to the current ongoing core valve trial, there was an inoperable group of uh, patients, that is patients deemed not feasible for mm -hmm. aortic valve standard surgery. And that was about a third of the patients. And then there was a high risk group that had high risk features for surgery, typically an SDS risk of about 11% in the, the data that's been presented. Mm -hmm. And in those patients, they were randomized to standard surgery versus the Sapien uh, transcatheter valve implantation. And in that high risk group, there was a further subgroup mm -hmm of patients where the, cat, where the device could be delivered from a transfemoral approach, mm 
and about a third of the patients where an apical approach was actually used. This is the data from so-called cohort B, which was the inoperable group uh, in the partner trial. And very impressive data. Um, I know this is a busy slide worth of data, but the um, important thing I think about this slide is the uh, mortality rate. If you look at the mortality at 30 days, it was slightly higher with the transcatheter valve implantation, really owing to the risk of uh, major vascular bleeding. Mm -hmm. This is a large 24 French, relatively rigid system uh, advanced from the femoral approach. And uh, so there was a lot of challenges with delivery and bleeding uh, with this approach. But the most impressive thing is if you're successful and you get this valve implanted compared to those patients who were treated with standard medical therapy, it was almost a 50% reduction in mortality, 30% of the year versus 50% in the group uh, treated with the transcatheter valve implantation. And this, uh, present, this data published last fall really uh, set the world on fire, I think, mm -hmm. from a TAVI point of view. Right. Uh, because we had a, we really had a mortality benefit, and here is that 50% one-year mortality in the medical arm, which has been there every time we've looked at uh, patients with severe aortic stenosis. I mean, it's remarkably stable, isn't it? Yeah. You know, we we talked about how MI mortality has come down, but for a valve disease, it really doesn't seem to have changed for 20 years. And it, you know, medical therapy for aortic stenosis almost is like an oxymoron. But just to maybe take a little bit of a tangential approach here. What are the medical options for these for these patients? I mean, let's say obviously you know not every patient is going to be a candidate for the TAVI programs. Um, ultimately, maybe the technology will get there. But what are the goals of medical therapy with with aortic stenosis? Yeah, the goals of medical therapy are typically symptomatic relief. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like most heart failure patients, which is the predominant symptoms you're treating with aortic stenosis, it's really a goal of preload reduction to try to improve symptoms of mm -hmm. congestion. Um, it really doesn't treat the primary process, right. but it can control symptoms. Uh, there are some patients that have coexisting hypertension and aortic stenosis where you can get some symptomatic benefit with careful afterload reduction. Mm -hmm. But most of the goal is really preload reduction, and the, the limitation there is fairly significant. Yeah, so it's really about quality of life rather than quantity. Yeah. And, and so that's why I think... You're right. I mean, these data really, I think, generated a tremendous amount of interest because it looks pretty clear from the data that we've not had good options for these right. patients. Right. And as I'll show in a, a few minutes, uh, these data have actually changed the approach to the uh, core valve trial, which is ongoing. Uh, so the FDA has uh, taken heed to these, uh, this information and actually changed the trial somewhat. Uh, I'll turn now to, uh, again, this is still the uh, partner trial data, but more recent data just presented last month at the ACC in New Orleans looking at the randomized cohort. So those groups of patients that were deemed to be high risk for surgery, uh, but were felt to be operative candidates, although high risk. Mm -hmm. And those patients were randomized, as, as you remember, to a one-to-one -one randomization of surgery versus transcatheter valve implantation with a sapien valve. And in that group, the transfemoral and transapical approaches were also separately randomized. So again, surgical AVR, transcatheter AVR, apical, same randomization in the femoral. The patient characteristics presented in New Orleans uh, look like what you might expect. The elderly population 83 years of age on average, have an STS risk uh, score of almost 12, and most of those patients in class three or class four heart failure. So I'll highlight this STS risk because I think the data is interesting when we actually see what happens. Yeah. If you look at all-cause mortality uh, going out to two years with the primary endpoint being at one year, you find that the transcatheter valve implantation had roughly equal mortality at a year to standard surgery. And so really they met their definition. This, the mm -hmm. primary endpoint was to show uh, non-inferiority of the transcatheter valve system. And again, very impressive results that, that uh, with a um, 
difficult system to use, I would say, the uh, transcatheter valve implantation really equals surgery in this high-risk group. There were some important differences, though, that are highlighted, and one of the main issues is the stroke risk. So again, a relatively rigid system, and you can see the stroke risk at the time of 30-day follow-up was about twice that in the standard surgical arm. So stroke risk with standard surgery we know is a big issue, especially with the elderly and how they want to be independent still. One of their main goals is to remain independent in a lot of these cases. And so this stroke risk is something that's going to have to be yeah. dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't statistically different at a year, but again, about twice the event rate in terms of uh, all stroke at uh, one year in the transcatheter valve implantation. Uh, the clinical outcomes, uh, as I mentioned and showed on that graph, were similar in terms of mortality. So at, the other thing I think this highlights is, is two issues. One is at 30 days, the surgical mortality was 6.5%. If we remember back to the STS risk, which is typically felt to be an underestimation yeah. of risk, you're estimating 12% and it was really 6.5%. So the surgeons in this trial need to be commended yeah. on getting these high-risk patients through. The transcatheter valve implantation patients did better at 30 days in terms of mortality risk, but there's a catch-up that occurs in this high-risk population so that at one year, the uh, mortality is, is not statistically different and uh, looks clinically similar at 24 versus 29 percent. And I think that's where another challenge is with this group is to know who's going to benefit because right. even if the valve is fixed, if you've got horrible interstitial lung disease and are on home oxygen, yeah. your survival may not be limited by your mm -hmm. valve. It may be limited by the other comorbidities which were frequent in this group that's being treated. Right. I mean, that's exactly what I was going to ask you. I mean, this is interesting, a little bit of a different dimension from the uh, the previous cohort in this trial. Here you have similar mortality, maybe slightly higher stroke rate. And so, you know, is this considered a positive trial in a sense, or is it really a trial that generates excitement about the fact that the technology is certainly feasible, provided that we can identify the right patients? I mean, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, I think, I think it's an exciting, and I would consider it a positive trial because it's really a first-generation device mm -hmm. that's shown equivalence to a, a great operation that's been around for decades. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very positive message, although I do think there are caveats that need to be considered, and, and who we treat is going to be one of them, and trying to improve the technology and improve the technique uh, to decrease the risk of stroke yeah. in the transcatheter uh, arm. I think that's, that's really where we're going to be headed. Mm -hmm. The hemodynamics, I think, uh, are interesting because you might expect, since the surgeons take out the old valve right. and the transcatheter valve implantation is really just push, pushing the stenotic leaflets uh, to the side that maybe the valve gradients would be higher in the transcatheter mm -hmm. arm, but in fact they're not. In fact, they're slslightly lower. Uh, if you look at 30-day uh, or one year, uh, they're statistically lower, although not clinically different. Mm -hmm. uh, 10 millimeters of mercury uh, versus 11 millimeters of mercury, but I only bring this up because when the transcatheter valves are implanted, it's dramatic that the gradient is oftentimes zero. So in the cath lab, when we're evaluating, you know, porcine surgical valves because of the sewing ring, yeah. they oftentimes have some minimal gradient, 5, 10 millimeters of mercury. But after implanting the transcatheter valves and you immediately reevaluate the gradient, mm -hmm. it's shocking to see the LV systolic pressure and the aortic pressure yeah. to be identical. Instant gratification. That's what we yeah, live for that's in terms right. of cardiology. It's a great day when you see that. <laughs> that's right. So I'll turn now to the core valve prosthesis and concentrate the rest of the uh, talk on uh, that technology and the current trial, uh, which we are participating in clinically. Uh, this prosthesis, as I mentioned, is really an engineering feat to me. Uh, they really carefully designed with the uh, inflow and outflow of this valve designed differently. The valve is temperature, or the nitinol stent is temperature sensitive, so 
when you put this in cold saline, it becomes soft, mm -hmm. and it allows you to load this system inside the catheter. And then when it's put at body temperature, this valve is really rigid. So if you try to crush the inflow with your fingers, it's really very, very rigid. The delivery system is uh, a uh, delivery pod through which the catheter uh, is uh, attached to the valve here and then loaded inside a delivery sheet. Uh, this is really the portion that requires the 18 French delivery sheet. The rest of the shaft of the catheter is 12 French, mm -hmm. and then the operator has this handle with this blue turning wheel, which allows you to gradually remove the sheet to allow the inflow of the valve to deploy first, and then you have the chance to do some subtle repositioning as the valve is fully deployed. Yeah, so that's exactly, you know, the, the interesting with the balloon uh, expandable, it seems like, like in the periphery, maybe you can sort of move it back and forth and try and get the exact positioning. With this, this does then allow you to recapture if you need to, to reposition? That's right. It isn't totally recapturable. Mm -hmm. um, to a point it is, but it becomes so rigid at body temperature that it really won't go back inside this uh, delivery catheter very well. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're working on a way to make that yeah. a totally recapturable recapturable system, but currently, if you deploy half of it, yeah. you can actually take it back out through the 18 French sheet and then recross and put another system in. I see. Uh, but in terms of being able to recapture and then redeploy the same yeah. device, it really doesn't mm -hmm. happen. This is uh, a slide just to highlight some of the advanced imaging that's really required for all these patients, and I think we'll get more and more used to this for aortic stenosis, a CT on the left, a standard echo on the right, and then an angiogram uh, on the far right, I'm sorry, the echo in the middle uh, frame there. And uh, CT is really incredibly helpful in terms of looking at the annulus and uh, making annular measurements. These annuluses are more elliptical than they are circular, mm -hmm. and so really understanding the dimensions is important. Understanding the angle that the annulus makes to a horizontal line across the chest is important for delivery of uh, this system. And then uh, really understanding the periphery uh, in CT angi angiographic terms is mm -hmm. very important. And so there are detailed measurements made uh, in the common iliac, external, and femoral to make sure this system can be delivered mm -hmm. uh, safely through the external vasculature. One thing that is feasible with core valve is with Sapien, there's an apical approach, but with core valve, there is a uh, axillary or subclavian approach. Wow. Preferred to be on the left side because of the angle, yeah. uh, but uh, we do have that as an option for those patients that don't have femoral access options. So what type, what sizes are you looking for here in terms of the, uh, the vessel size? Yeah, that's a great question. Or so lumen sizes, I guess, if people have PAD, yeah. Yeah, so typically you're looking for 7 millimeter diameter vessels are bigger. Mm -hmm. And you're, you would hope to find vessels that are not extreme uh, tortuosity. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is that severe calcification that makes the vessel incredibly rigid yeah. is a challenge. So the ideal patient is somebody that doesn't have Tremendous pelvic tortuosity that's mm -hmm. got seven millimeter common femorals and iliacs who uh, doesn't have excessive uh, calcification. This is a trial overview, but as I said, um, there is one change um, that happened a couple months ago by the FDA uh, looking at the core valve trial. It is similar to the partner trial in terms of its rationale. Mm -hmm. The high risk group in blue here is patients that have an estimated risk that's 15% or greater and are randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to transcatheter core valve implantation versus surgical aortic valve uh, uh, replacement done in the standard fashion. In the extreme risk group, which is called inoperable in, uh, in the partner trial, it's really the same group. Now, the extreme risk really comes down to two surgeons that are certified in the trial, both examining a patient and deeming the patient non-surgical. So the estimated risk in the, in the um, protocol is 50%, yeah. but really that 50% isn't a hard number. 50% mm -hmm. uh, operative risk, hard to predict 
Uh, and so really what we're looking for is two surgeons that are both convinced that surgery would be ill-advised. Yeah. And if that's the case, then all of those patients, unlike this slide says, it was previously a two-to-one randomization of the valve, but uh, the FDA has uh, since uh, gotten rid of the requirement for the medical therapy arm. So if you do meet extreme risk, all those patients do get treatment, which is a great thing for patients. Yeah, and obviously we can't put words in the mouth of the FDA, but it does appear at least to be somewhat of a tacit vote of confidence for the, for the technology. Yes. Yeah, I think you're right. And then also the mortality in the medical arm yeah. is so daunting, as you mentioned, you know, as bad as ALL in the adults. So mm -hmm. I think having something to offer those patients, I think the FDA very wisely said it's time to get rid of that. Yeah. So... Uh, quickly then, this trial in uh, the Corval study, it's 40 U.S. centers, about 1,300 patients, extreme risk, about a third of the patients, meaning inoperable, high risk randomized, the other two thirds. Uh, the extreme risk cohort is really now to, to uh, not really being compared to medical therapy anymore, but really just looking at it compared to historical control. The high-risk cohort is, again, to show non-inferiority with this prosthesis, the Corval prosthesis, to standard surgery at one year. The screening is extensive, as you mentioned, Sunil. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not standard screening. They have to be screened clinically. Uh, we have a meeting here every Wednesday morning at 645. We have four surgeons and five interventionalists looking at the data, and then we decide if they are really a candidate. Once we think they are, all the data, including the imaging, gets uploaded to a central server mm -hmm. and a, uh, uh, a core uh, lab looks at this data and then there's a screening committee phone call mm -hmm. to review it and see if everybody agrees it's a good idea. So multiple levels of looking at the same data to make yes. sure the patients are the right candidates for the trial. Yeah, it's very, it's probably the most intense trial yeah. I've ever been in. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the screening calls are intense. Uh, there's a lot of challenge to the anatomy, and so you really have to be absolutely certain on your end that the patient uh, is going to be feasible before uh, considering it. Uh, the screening uh, quickly is really just clinical evaluation, but it includes some things like an STS risk, six-minute walk test, neurologic evaluations, and then echocardiography is typically used for diagnosis, but a lot of the annular measurements are more uh, relied upon by CT, really, than echo. Mm -hmm. CT, really critical in this. And then cornea angiography has to be done on all these patients ahead of time because if they do have coronary disease, it has to be treated up front before they're mm -hmm. entered in the trial. And that's an important thing to remember because if you've got proximal LAD disease, that has to be treated percutaneously before you can be considered mm -hmm. because they do not want to compare AVR cabbage right. to transcatheter valve implantation. I think you're going to get to the exclusion criteria, but what if someone does have surgical coronary disease? So if somebody has surgical coronary disease, then I think you have really two options. Mm -hmm. if, if they're in the high-risk group and you think they could get through surgery, they're probably better off having complete revascularization and valve replacement yeah. if it's feasible yeah. from a clinical perspective. But if it's not, then treating the most critical portions of their coronary disease yeah. percutaneously would be the next best solution. Mm -hmm. So the inclusion criteria are fairly straightforward. You have to have heart failure that's at least functional class two, most of them higher than that. You have to have degenerative aortic stenosis with a mean gradient greater than 40, four meters per second by echo, mm -hmm. and a valve area less than 0.8. And then you have to meet criteria clinically uh, in SDS and other risk factors that meets high or excessive risk cohorts. Mm -hmm. In the exclusion criteria, some of these are, you would think are relatively straightforward and, and logical, which include having an MI within mm -hmm. 30 days. If you have an angioplasty and stent done, you have to wait 30 days. Mm -hmm. If it's DES that's been used, you have to wait six months. Okay. So most of these people are being treated with bare metal stents if they have coexisting coronary disease. Uh, and, but some of the things that, that do come up, like patients who have religious preferences against blood products, where you might think this would be a good solution. We can put in something without surgery, 
but those patients are excluded from the clinical trial currently. Mm -hmm. Now, clinically, if these devices get approved, I think those patients will be treated yeah. in, in this way, but right now uh, those patients can't be treated. Mm -hmm. The other high-risk group that comes up not infrequently is the patients on dialysis, right. and those patients are excluded right now from the trial. As I mentioned, there's a lot of anatomic exclusion, so even these people that meet the clinical criteria that look straightforward clinically that they should be in the trial, you really have to make sure that the valve will work yeah. that it's going to fit, that it's going to be stable, and it's going to be effective. And then you have to make sure you can deliver it. And so annulus is for core valve between 20 and 27 millimeters can be included. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that with the current technology with Sapien, it only goes up to 25. So the mm -hmm. larger annuluses really yeah. can only be treated percutaneously with this device. The ascending aorta is important in the, in the core valve because, as you remember, the, the outflow hourglass has to sit properly in the right. ascending aorta, so diameters there are important. And then this annular angle that I mentioned briefly is really a critical issue because mm -hmm. if the root is too horizontal, the valve comes in at such an acute angle that it can't be placed properly. I see. So really what you would love to have as an operator is a, a vertical aorta, mm -hmm. that is, um, someone with a vertical heart that the aorta comes off in a fairly vertical fashion. That happens un infrequently sure, in, in the elderly. Sure, in population, yeah. But uh, the closer to that you get, the better. Mm -hmm. Bicuspid valves uh, not being treated in this uh, trial mm -hmm. uh, because of the eccentricity of the um, uh, annulus and the fact that you end up sometimes with a lot of AI with those yeah. patients. And then other valve diseases are excluded, but the main one is number 10, vascular anatomy that's not amenable to delivery, that is, not, not amenable to safe delivery. Mm -hmm. There's very close follow-up on these people, uh, and as part of the trial, they're seen in a month, six months, and then yearly for five years, sort of typical device follow-up, mm -hmm. but very intense follow-up, including echo and other imaging techniques to make sure things are working out. The last thing I'll mention is just that this is a football team effort. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh, it's a little different than uh, uh, some of us are used to in the cath lab where we're dealing with, you know, a staff of uh, three or four maybe, mm -hmm. and um, you're, you're working with several people. But between anesthesia, echo, the OR team, the, the cath lab team, and the, uh, even the loading the device takes a separate team. So mm -hmm. there is a huge team of people involved with this trial at Duke. It's uh, very... Uh, interactive and really been yeah. uh, rewarding, challenging at times to get everybody on the same page at the same sure. time, but uh, very rewarding to work together. And I think that's the other excitement about this mm -hmm. is you've got people with different skill sets working in the same room now. Mm -hmm. And I think there's going to be new things that are going to come out that are going to be even better for patients. Absolutely. So this is the, the physical room where that happens at Duke. This is uh, uh, the hybrid operating room, uh, as you know, down on the third floor in, mm -hmm. in the uh, sterile core. Uh, so uh, it provides a sterile environment for us to work in, and uh, it's a very large room with state-of-the-art imaging, uh, both in terms of radiographic imaging and other ancillary imaging that you might want during the procedure. That's terrific. You know, we have just a, a few minutes left, and, I, you know, this is just an incredibly exciting technology. I wanted you to sort of look in the crystal ball here a little bit. You know, in Europe, one of these devices has received CE mark approval, and it's diffused out into the community such that there are over 15,000 implants now. How do you think that this should be rolled out? Let's project a couple of years in the future and say that it gets FDA approval. Do we want this in everybody's hands? Well, I think um, initially I wouldn't see it that way because I think it involves such an incredible team effort mm -hmm that I think uh, putting it in everybody's hands won't really be safe initially. Where it ends up in the long run, I think, depends on the technology, mm -hmm. uh, how uh, this technology moves forward to make it more uh, user-friendly, to make it safer for patients, mm -hmm. uh, to make it more of a s standard percutaneous uh, procedure rather than a truly hybrid approach. Mm -hmm. uh, those kind of things, I think, are going to determine uh, where it falls out. The other thing I think we still don't know is, is this as good as standard surgery? Yeah. Is it as durable? It, it looks good out to several years, mm -hmm. uh, but the surgeons would say, you know, with 
tissue valves in the aortic position, they're hoping for 10, maybe right. 15 years. And so we don't have that data yet with this yeah. technology. Uh, the other thing I think that's a little different from a technical point of view is that most of these patients are left with uh, some paravalvular AI, mm -hmm. um, whereas the surgeons wouldn't put up with that. Right. And uh, it seems to be quite well tolerated, but does that, is this technology going to improve to eliminate that? And is this technology going to be durable enough that you would offer it to a 60-year-old with standard mm -hmm. surgical risk? That's sort of the holy grail. Right. I don't. I think it, it's we're still not at that point. Yeah. So these are similar issues that we've had with other technologies on the cath lab, haven't we? So a lot to look forward to. I yeah. think. Well, great. This has been a terrific program. My guest faculty today has been Kevin Harrison, my colleague here at Duke. Kevin, thanks again for joining us. And to all of you, uh, then, until next time, from all of us here at Duke, this is Sunil Rao saying thanks for joining us and take care. <laughs>